We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. Welcome everyone and thanks for joining us. Special thanks to our panelists and presenters this afternoon. My name is Agustina del Campo. I direct the Center for Studies on Freedom of Expression and Access to Information, CELE at Universidad de Palermo in Buenos Aires. It's a pleasure to be here and to have such great panelists joining me today. So what we're discussing today is a paper that we prepared from CELE with the Inter-American Institute for Human Rights um, on the issue of disinformation and public officials. Um, as you probably have seen from the, from the schedule of the IGF, there are several panels that are dealing with the issue of disinformation. There's a renewed relevance and attention to this issue since 2016. Um, a grave concern on um, states, civil society, academia, on how to deal with the circulation and dissemination of fake news and disinformation. And what we planned here was to present uh, research that we conducted this year on the role of public officials and their discourse in the dissemination of um, disinformation and how at least some of the legal systems within Latin America deal with this, with this concern. Um, a recent study published um, from the UK showed that public officials were responsible for around 20% of the total of disinformation um, circulating online. But that 20% that they're responsible for gets nearly 75% of all the interaction that people have with fake news and disinformation. So it's a huge impact for only 20% of, um, of that content that is being generated. To present the paper, we have Eduardo Bartoni. Eduardo is the representative of the regional office for South America of the Inter-American Institute for Human Rights. He's the former director of the National Access to Public Information Agency and the former director of the National Data Protection Authority in Argentina. Previously, Professor Bertoni was the special rapporteur for freedom of expression at the Organization of American States within the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. And thereafter, we're gonna give um, the floor to Professor Fernando Varenz. Professor de Varenz is the extraordinary professor at the Faculty of Law at the University of Pretoria in South Africa. He's adjunct professor at the National University of Ireland in Galway, and the Cheng Yu Tung visiting professor at the Faculty of Law at the University of Hong Kong. He was appointed UN United Nations Special Rapporteur on Minority Issues by the Human Rights Council and assumed his functions on August 1st, 2017. Last but certainly not least, we have Mariana Valente, who's the director of Internet Lab. Internet Lab is a leading Brazilian think tank dealing with um, human rights and technology. She holds a doctorate, a master's degree, and a bachelor from the University of Sao Paulo Law School. She's professor at Innsbruck University. She was a re visiting researcher at the University of California Berkeley and the CVs for all of them goes on and on. But since we have a short time, I'll give the floor first to Eduardo and then to our two commenters. Eduardo. Thank you. Thank you, Agustina. Thanks for your kind presentation. And thank you very much for the invitation to present the paper that we contributed to develop with CELA. Uh, as Agustina mentioned, I am the representative of the regional office 
for South America, for Inter-American Institute of Human Rights. And these kind of papers or this kind of research are the typical research that an academic institution like the Inter-American Institute usually do. The Inter-American Institute is almost 41 years old and the regional office was established in Montevideo in Uruguay, where I am right now in 2009. Uh, I would say that uh, the main force for the paper was that little has been done to identify the origins of misinformation and also to evaluate the phenomenon in light of specific, specific obligation from certain sectors. Um, we consider, and we, we, in the paper, we, 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 we mentioned that the responses to mis misinformation in social media have mainly aimed at penalizing its authors or establishing liability for those who facilitated its dissemination. For example, internet companies, especially large platforms, have deployed numerous techniques, measures, and instruments to address the phenomenon. In the paper, we concluded that first, it would be wrong to attribute to social media an exclusive, and I highlight exclusive role in the new disinformation crisis that impacts the information ecosystem. And I like to highlight exclusive because we are not denying the role of the platforms, but we are not focused in the paper in their role. And second, we also concluded that this information has different impacts depending on who promotes it. And public officials have special responsibilities regarding their speeches, what they said. This last point actually is the central goal or the central object of the study. Our research looks into some of the obligations of public officials and also other public persons like candidates for public offices, obligations to tell the truth and or take measures to avoid mistakes in the information they disseminate in, the, in, the, in their duties, during their duties in their offices. Finally, and I don't want to be too long to open the discussion with my colleagues here in the panel and with the people attending this panel as well. Finally, I said, we also concluded that public officials have a duty, have a duty to tell the truth in their speech and expressions. And it is not only an ethical duty. They have also legal duties. And this is what we demonstrated in our research. And for that reason, following the logic of this obligation, we suggested at the end of the paper to look into new possible lines of investigation in the search of for solutions to the dissemination of disinformation and the harm to public debate. This was a very, very short summary of what we did in the paper and we are very open for discussions, comments, and conversation on the main issues that we included in the paper. Thank you very much. Thanks, Eduardo, for that um, introduction to the paper. Um, I'll give the floor to Fernando de Varens. Thank you, Madame Del Campo. Uh, merci, muchas gracias. Uh, distinguished speakers, ladies and gentlemen, mesdames et messieurs, señoras y caballeros. Let me first thank uh, the organizers, and in particular, the Centro de Estudios en Libertad de Expresión y Acceso a la Información for the privilege and honor of being part of such a distinguished good group of experts who will, I'm sure, contribute greatly to better understanding and dealing with what is perhaps, well, really one of the greatest challenges to, of recent decades, arise not only of mis misinformation, but also disinformation, hate speech, and even incitement to violence, including most worryingly calls to genocide, mainly targeting minorities. I think we all know that uh, this is dividing and even breaking up societies 
in many parts of the world. And my comments will be uh, more from a global perspective rather than limited to Latin America. And I think that conceptually um, to merely present this session as involving misinformation and censorship kind of glosses over the closely related issues that we are facing. We need to appreciate that what we're dealing with is not only misinformation, it is not only censorship, and it's not only about disinformation on the internet and human rights. It's too facile to say that the complexity that we're dealing with goes beyond regulation and self-regulation or digital security or fact checking. It requires all of those, a kind of holistic approach that contains all of these dimensions and, and more. And I think first I need to share very briefly some of the much needed contextualization to, to more fully appreciate what we're facing. Platform owners such as Facebook, Google, and others are among the world's new hyper nouveau riche. Their business models, many of the algorithms that they use are premised or based on, as you all know, creating rabbit holes and amplifiers of prejudice, racism, and disinformation, and they profit from it. I think we, it be beyond talking about the responsibilities of public officials, we need to understand what we're dealing with. Social media platforms have had a very profitable free run for a long time. And public officials and governments and the world cannot afford any longer the wild west of misinformation, disinformation, that, and hate without consequences or liabilities for those uh, uh, major platform owners to a large degree. And let me be very blunt here. Social media literally profit from hate. They profit from disinformation, essentially as a result of the algorithms that they use in most of their business models. They are also among the most profitable private enterprises in the world today. And they have little or no financial liability or responsibility. And this I've suggested needs to be addressed head on by public officials and others. No private business should be immune to the harm and violence which they can directly contribute to and can unleash. And currently that's what they have, largely immunity through the effects amongst others of the United States Communications Decency Act, a legislation that generally provides immunity for website platforms with respect to third party content, with a few exceptions dealing with copyright of all things or sex trafficking issues. In other words, we have and public officials are treating the major social media platforms as, uh, as being allowed without any serious financial consequences to spread misinformation leading to violence, real harm in the real world, including atrocities, and even calls to genocide. And they can do that with little or no liability except for copyright issues. Come on, something smells rotten. And it's not only in Denmark in this kind of context. So to be absolutely clear, while social media platforms offer people the opportunity to connect, share, and engage, an unfortunate and unhealthy side effect is that harmful and misinformative content can go viral in a matter of minutes and spread to thousands, even millions, before platform owners can catch it and try to mitigate sometimes its effects. So I mentioned this because it means that governments and public officials need to go beyond self-regulation by private platforms themselves, which is the preferred approach in many countries. Self-regulation is necessarily necessary, but it's clearly not enough. And we saw it even just last week, some of you may have heard that uh, Twitter announced it would start penalizing users who tweet private media or images of other user, users that is shared without their consent. Um, but because the policy is vague, uh, recent reports of just the last few days have shown that Twitter's reporting and appeals process is unre unreliable, automated, and not able to judge when, in fact, it is being their policy is being misused by racists or xenophobic groups 
uh, to be very blunt, very clear, it's been reported that far right movements like the Proud Boys and QAnon have actually uh, called on their followers to weaponize the new, rule, the new rules to target human rights activists who had posted about them. And Twitter went on just last week, in fact, to suspend the accounts of groups that are actually defending human rights and trying to fight against racist and anti-Semitic groups amongst others. Once again, self-regulation here is not clearly not enough. Um, and therefore there needs to be and uh, from the government side, from the side of public officials, uh, clearer steps taken to address even calls to violence against minorities and even calls to genocide amongst others. And I think it's important to remember that uh, the genocide that we know as the Shoah or the Holocaust did not begin with gas chambers. It actually started with misinformation and disinformation against a minority. The Nazis effectively used propaganda, mis misinformation and disinformation to win the support of millions of Germans to facilitate persecution and ultimately genocide of mainly the Jewish and Roma minorities. So social media platforms have become through misinformation and disinformation, propaganda megaphones. And now they amplify intolerance and prejudice and spewing propaganda of hate and racism, reaching almost immediately huge number of people causing real harm, literally leading to individuals around the world being vilified, doxxed or pointed out, lined up, lynched, and even in some parts of the world massacred because they belong to dehumanize others, usually and overwhelmingly minorities. And the data we have in some countries suggests, for example, that three quarters of hate crimes is social media. Let me repeat that. Three quarters of all hate speech is in the end uh, forms of misinformation and disinformation aimed at minorities. So, and I know the time is limited, the use of social media has been playing a widely acknowledged role in atrocities and even attempted genocide against minorities such as the Rohingya in Myanmar it has led to actually massacres and destruction of property for other minorities such as in Sri Lanka and India uh, more recently. Two points I'd like to make, perhaps um, in closing. Neither governments nor social, media, nor social media platforms, and when I say government, I also mean public officials, neither of them are doing near enough, despite some recognition and a few steps in the right direction. Two dimensions are still missing, admission and liability. Admission in the sense that almost none admit beyond generalities that the main victims of misinformation and dis disinformation and also hate speech are overwhelmingly minorities. And that freedom of expression does not protect or does not exclude responsibility for certain forms of speech, such as hate speech that can constitute incitement to violence or discrimination. There are forms of information and disinformation which must be prosecuted in international law in, in treaties such as Article 20 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which clearly states that any advocacy of national, racial, or religious hatred that constitutes incitement to discrimination, hostility, or violence must be prohibited by law. It's a legal obligation on governments and really has to be recognized as such and applied by public servants. This is not always the case. And most media platforms seem to content themselves with bland, sanitized statements of protecting everyone who is, who is vulnerable. But what they're doing is actually refusing to name, uh, to name who are, um, who are the main targets. You must act on information and uh, misinformation and disinformation where it is most applied. And it is mostly applied in ways that target vulnerable groups, especially minorities. Unless you name the evil for what it is and the evil propaganda we're dealing with, you're not going to be uh, able to do it. Yes, it's complicated. 
But that's why I suggested in my last report to the UN General Assembly that the time has come for a global approach and leadership to regulate hate speech, misinformation and disinformation in social media, in which actually contravenes some of the uh, obligations that we have in international law and to deal directly with the issue of the immunity of social media platforms for most of the harm that they cause. A global regulatory approach, specifically a legally binding treaty would allow to protect freedom of expression and particularly uh, recognize its dimensions while providing guidelines on the forms of excitement which needs to be regulated and limited once again while protecting freedom of, of expression, but also tackling the anomaly of social media currently not being liable for any of the harm or damage caused by, by them, by social media, contrary to what occurs to other types of media in the world. My time is, is up. Um, there's much more that could be said, but we'll have opportunities to dwell more deeply on some of the issues which I've raised rather uh, superficially in a few minutes allowed to me. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. I think one of the things that come out from, from what you were saying is the complexity around dealing with disinformation, disinformation, particularly when it relates to minorities and to hate speech, which are in a lot of cases, unfortunately, very related, as you were saying. Um, I think one of the one of the one of the key intentions of the paper was precisely to look at this issue from a, from a perspective that could bring to light complexities that we thought uh, were not on the spotlight. Um, and I, I agree with you that there's a number of concerns around how social media platforms deal with this kind of speech, in my personal opinion, at least, um, the, the amount of energy that is being put towards finding solutions to the social media dilemma exceeds by far the amount of energy being put on what you said, admission and liability, uh, which probably should be part of this conversation as well. Mariana, can I give the floor to you? Sure. Thanks, Agustina. Thanks, Eduardo Bertoni, Fernando Varenes. Thank you for presenting, setting the stage for this discussion. Um, I wanted to start by um, just briefly discussing what happened in Brazil in the past couple of years, um, because I think it's a very good example of information disorders and the role of public agents and this is not me saying, but we had a congressional investigation in the past months in Brazil that subpoenaed many um, people from the private sector, the, per the public sector. Uh, it conducted really a very large, also documental investigation to understand the role of public authorities in the huge, immense number of deaths due to the pandemic in Brazil. And as many of you know, we had um, we had a very hard pandemic. It hit us really hard. We had more than 600,000 deaths in the country. And we had high-ranking officials and particularly the president right from the beginning saying things like, this is just a little flu and making open propaganda for medicines such as hydroxychloroquine and other medicines that have been rendered ineffective uh, by science. Um, and the congressional investigations went into all of these episodes and while well, they're all recorded, many of them are on social media too. And uh, one of the conclusions of this investigation was that uh, the federal government as a whole, it contributed decisively to this disaster that took more than 600,000 lives and that authorities were allowing for the deaths of Brazilians in the pandemic. Uh, it's, a, it's a really interesting document to look at. Actually, the whole report has 
1,200 pages. It's huge. Uh, and it allocated many different crimes, uh, including crimes against humanity, uh, but it also had things that are related to spreading uh, disinformation, spreading false information about the pandemic and it established the responsibility of these public officials. Now the document has to go to the authorities that are responsible for prosecuting these people and this is what's happening um, in Brazil right now. And I'm telling that because I think it's a good um, example of how of course we're speaking of this information of this information spreading through social media and coming from when we're speaking of this information online we're, we're also speaking of this challenge of um, communications that are decentralized and that uh, are coming from everywhere but i think this is an episode that shows the centrality uh, that public authorities can have, especially in a situation of an emergency, like what's happening now. And um, I'm sorry that the, that the phone is ringing, uh, like an emergency that's, um, that was uh, happening now um, and how, um, and how that can really take uh, people's lives because people are looking in that situation, people are looking for information, right? They were looking for the authorities to just provide any information. So that was part of uh, my, my presentation. But what I also wanted to say is that in this report that Eduardo Bertoni mentions, uh, there are some examples of how uh, we have a very, um, it, it's not a very good actually framework in Brazil for dealing with the, this problem of public authorities spreading this information or their role in this information. But as many of you know, we have been discussing in the country since last year, uh, this bill that's called, uh, it has been called the fake news bill. Now it's become something much broader, not addressing just uh, the problem of this information. It's a, a bill for accountability on social media. And the way it states right now, it's being discussed now in Congress, uh, it has a whole chapter on what's been called uh, public interest accounts. And uh, there are two approaches to these public interest accounts. And then we're looking to, to how uh, public authorities express themselves on the internet, right? Because in many of these cases, we're not speaking just of the internet, but looking at the internet, um, there's this concern on the one side of social media blocking or restraining this course of these public authorities. That's one of the concerns. But the other one relates to the behavior of these public authorities. There's the def this definition of what, of which authorities we're speaking of um, and which are the accounts that are going to be considered public interest accounts. But what I'm referring to Article 22, in case you end up looking at uh, the bill. What uh, the bill is stating is that uh, because they're public interest accounts, first, there's this problem of blocking users, journalists, that's something that's happening everywhere, right? They're not allowed uh, to block users because it's understood that they're performing a public role, but also, and that is one of the things that's interesting, uh, is that they're subject to the constitutional principles governing public administration. And these are five constitutional principles in Brazil, legality, personality, morality, publicity, and efficiency. And this particular part of the bill has been seen as a way of stating that these public authorities, they have the duty uh, to act according to all those principles online and to make sure that they're not spreading information that anyhow violates these principles. And in many cases, the examples that I was giving could be considered examples uh, of speech that violates these principles. So there's this idea that these are specific accounts, that they're not accounts like all the other accounts and that they should be subject uh, to, to these principles. And then one thing that's also interesting is Article 23 of this bill, it states 
that those who are holding elected offices and also judges, members of the public um, uh, prosecution office, that they're forbidden to receive remuneration from advertising on their accounts. And that uh, has come from this diagnosis that uh, because these public officers many times are receiving, um, they're receiving ad money uh, from their activities online, that could, be, um, that could be an incentive for a sensational speech, for trying to uh, uh, like make a hit out of a certain post of out of certain certain information instead of speaking according to public principles principles of the public discourse and I find that really interesting because I think um, it's an article that sort of brings together both discussions the responsibility the, the accountability of public officials and also um, the architecture of networks and how the, all those things play out together and I think it's quite original in that sense. There's a couple of other things I'd like to say, but I guess uh, we could go, we could move to the debate. Uh, there's this one final remark, which I'd like to say, I really uh, appreciate that uh, Fernanda Varennes was uh, mentioning how minorities are especially affected uh, by this information. I think this is something that we're not speaking of enough. Um, and I think we have, quite a few examples of how that also happens when we're speaking of public authorities, right? Um, we've been seeing uh, many cases of uh, minorities being affected by the speech of, of public authorities. That has been the case also during the pandemic and all during the whole information crisis that somehow uh, Brazil is, go is going through. We've seen um, high ranking officials Speaking of female journalists, for example, in very discriminatory manners, um, but also things that are more subtle. So we've developed a research uh, this year about gender disinformation in Brazil in the pandemic. And one of the things that we were seeing was that one of the discourses that was being spread, um, so the president himself was saying for a while that he was immune because he's got this athlete record and that started to be repeated many times by many people that if you have like an athlete record, if you're strong enough, if you're healthy or something like that, you wouldn't get that little flu as he called it. Uh, but we were realizing when we were analyzing the discourses around it that it, this had a very gendered perspective to that uh, it really meant masculinity and it really meant strength in that sense. So that was also really interesting to see, just to bring those connections because I think they're all, they're, they're really, really interesting too. So I'll open the floor. I'll, I'll give the floor back to Agostina actually. <laughs> Thanks, Mariana. Um, I'd like to pick you up where you left it off. Uh, so we have these instances, we know that disinformation, misinformation, fake news um, have uh, tend to circulate more and have a more radical impact, particularly on minorities and vulnerable populations, when it's coming from public officials. And there is certainly a tension between a right to access information, this what you were saying about the accounts, which accounts should should be guided by which standards, um, which should be considered public interest accounts, and what rules should we apply to those public interest accounts, I think show an existing tension between access to information and the need to know what are what our public officials think and what they say and how they argue the policy that they make, and the potential damage that they can do when the information that they spread is hate speech, misinformation, disinformation that impacts specifically uh, minorities or vulnerable populations. And my question for you guys, before I open it up to everyone else who can, by the way, please include in the chat your questions or raise your hand and uh, we'll definitely give you the floor to ask questions. Um, my questions, so my question to you guys um, is, 
we all know what the principles are. We know the standards that are out there. The standards are international standards. They are within the ICCPR. They are within the Inter-American um, Convention. There are specific obligations, um, like uh, Professor De Varens was saying. There are specific prohibitions against hate speech that constitutes incitement to violence and to to discrimination. And there are rules like we've seen in the research that we've, we've done. There are legal rules within our internal legal systems that prescribe the limits or the obligations that public officials should respect or abide by in their speech. What, what could be done? What can be done to better implement these duties? Should, it, but should companies implement these for the state? Should the state implement these by prosecuting public officials uh, according to the laws that they already have? Is this an ethical thing? A lot of the regulations pertaining to public official speech is, um, is stated in ethical obligations of public officials, for example. How do we move the conversation forward? Um, paying particular attention to the, to the impact that these discourses may have um, on, on vulnerable populations. Eduardo, do you wanna start? Okay. Well, this, uh, what you just said is the, is the, is the core of our research of, of, of the paper. Uh, but having said that, I have to mention that we did not include a definitely answer there on what should be done. But let me, let me give you some uh, ideas that jumped to my mind after hearing my colleagues in the panel and, and you as well. First of all, if someone asked me if I am in favor to uh, regulate uh, the platforms in such a way to uh, diminish misinformation and disinformation, I would say yes. Why not? They are part of the problem and we need that. Actually, I just published another research, research another paper talking about responsibility of non-state actor for human rights violations and also the responsibility of the states when the states are not doing nothing on that. So, but that is not what I discussed in the paper that I presented today. What I presented today is trying to find other ways to cope with the problem of misinformation. I'm not denying the, 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 the importance of paying attention on what the intermediaries, the internet uh, companies or other social media platforms are doing. I'm not denying that at all, but this is not the core of the paper. The core of the paper is trying to find other ways to cope with the problem. And it is very interesting because if you, if you see what's going on, and this is just an example, what's going on these days in Colombia. These days in Colombia, uh, the government is promoting a legislation to penalize the people that say some wrongs or some uh, things that are that could damage the honor or the reputation of public officials. So there is a lot of lot of effort coming from the government to penalize common citizens that say something that probably is a mistake or could be a mistake in relations to a public official. I'm not seeing in any part of the world a similar effort to penalize, as you say, Agustina, public officials that knowing that they are lying, lie publicly using social media platforms and creates all of the problems that uh, Fernand and also uh, Mariana just said. So what I mentioned on what we worked in the paper is saying, hey guys, pay attention to that. Public officials, have a duty 
They have a responsibility. They cannot because they have, you know, some sort of uh, coverage uh, or some sort of immunity, say whatever they want, hate speech, lying, lying on whatever that affects concrete community. So that is the core of the paper. The core of the paper is try to find something else, not only, you know, what Fernand presented in his report that I agree, to start thinking in some sort of regulation of, 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 of platforms. Actually, what Fernand said about the immunity of the intermediary, the internet intermediary, uh, internet companies, particularly the section 230C in the uh, Communication Act of the, of the United States, that kind of immunity, is a, it's an immunity created in the US and as far as I understand, it's just for the US. I mean, all the companies try to cover the, uh, behind the 230. But in the US today, there is a very high discussion about reform and 230. My final word. I am not, you know, uh, advocating for any kind of regulation. Of course, I'm advocating for good regulations. That I'm, I don't want to see in the future more problems than solutions because we start regulating the, this platform. But this is for other debate. Thank you. Professor Torrens, in two minutes, there's so much to say. Yes, I know. Thank you very much. I'll just uh, reinforce perhaps one point that Eduardo just raised. Um, we're actually in other countries in the world, we're seeing a phenomenon where you have governments actually adopting legislation and persecuting essentially human rights defenders and, and critics of government uh, policies, but also critics of public officials. And you have the ironic situation where it's the human rights defenders and advocates that are being persecuted under legislation that is supposed to protect, one would think, uh, freedom of expression and human rights in those countries. So it's actually a phenomenon that is occurring right now in a number of countries. Um, I'd like to just also add that the devil is in the detail. And contrary to what we might believe, what is freedom of expression? The, uh, the obligations to uh, prohibit legally the uh, incitement to violence and discrimination but also the permissible, other types of permissible restrictions necessary to protect public health or public order is actually um, not clear yet, not necessarily very clear. And that's why to avoid the kind of situations uh, that Eduardo described, to protect the human rights defenders and, and critics of governments, I think that's why we do need a re regulatory framework at the global level to actually more clearly uh, set out how, what are these human rights in these very complex areas uh, because we haven't done it yet. And I've seen even uh, social media platforms allege, claim that they are enshrining, incorporating human rights obligations in their approach and various uh, uh, mechanisms. In fact, they don't do it. Very often, for example, they don't have full recognition of what is uh, the prohibition of discrimination in international human rights law. So there's a lot that needs to be done to clarify this area. Thank you very much. Merci. Thank you, Mariana. From my side, Agustina, um, one of the things I was thinking when preparing this is precisely how difficult it is to enforce uh, such a measure. So for example, uh, establishing that these are public interest accounts and that they should follow these principles, that's great. What does that mean, right? Does that mean that when platforms realize that constitutional principles are not being followed by public, um, by public officials' accounts, that they should, that they have the duty, that they have the responsibility? It doesn't seem to be the case, okay? But that could be one of the discussions, right? That this is something that social media should control. Does that mean that someone can bring it uh, to a court? and uh, have it determined that uh, these principles haven't been followed. Uh, if that's the case, um, is that going to have any role? Because we know that this information travels super fast. Is it uh, about uh, holding someone accountable after they said it? Well, we've been seeing that this has been precisely the strategy of politicians who deal with chaos, right? Creating chaos, even if, 
just a few days after um, the information, uh, the true information comes out, uh, it doesn't matter, right? It is the chaos that's the strategy. So uh, our time is almost up. <laughs> I just want to say I don't have a good answer, but this is what we should be discussing, I think. Well, exactly. Our time is almost up. I want to thank you all. I think we've um, we've at least tackled a few of the of the very complex issues that make up this whole uh, disinformation dilemma. That um, in a number of conversations, it seems oversimplified at times. Um, and I think, at least in our time together, with we've um, been able to give the conversation a little bit more shadows and more lights to it so as to make the debate a little bit uh, deeper and a little bit stronger so i thank you very much and i invite you to read the paper uh, if you haven't read the paper it's in french it's in portuguese in spanish and in english and thanks everyone for joining <laughs>